So what I believe is what unites us as physicians, as parents and providers, is much greater than what divides us. For as a society of individuals caring for our loved ones, we can all agree the relief of suffering is considered one of the primary ends of the practice of medicine. From a parent perspective, mothers and fathers put the care of their children before their own health. The conflicting information, lack of necessary research on diagnosis and treatment currently provided on Lyme disease has many doctors divided on how to provide the needed care for patients suffering from tick-borne disease and leaves many parents and Lyme sufferers in the dark without being seen or heard. This uncertainty has had tragic consequences, paralyzing doctors' ability to properly care for their patients, resulting in many parents and patients feeling hopeless and untrusting of the medical system. The lack of attention to Lyme and its associated diseases has led to what we believe chronic debilitating conditions and even death. Lyme disease needs to be part of every physician's differential diagnosis. Without considering Lyme disease as the cause for a patient's infliction, we are sending patients down a spiral path of unnecessary and potentially harmful procedures and treatments. The increasing trend of Lyme disease epidemic has been ascribed to ineffective preventive measures, inaccurate, outdated, and unreliable testing which health providers are relying on for diagnosis, suboptimal treatment regimens, and an incomplete understanding of the nature of the causative spirochete and other associated infections. Lyme disease is a public health crisis. So the agenda for this presentation is really to give you from my perspective, not only as a physician, but as a parent. And I can tell you that if my child was sick, you'd do anything, anything to care for your child. And that's what we see. We take care of patients that are children and then find out that the parents have been suffering for years but they couldn't either afford or even think of themselves to get treated. And therefore, they typically come much later to get treated, and that is unfair. So I am here today to present you with the parent perspective. We have so many moms and so many dads here trying to make a difference. They're fighting for the lives of their children, and you see that with Tammy and Rico, you see that with Holly, and the number of other parents that are here today. I want all parents of Lyme sufferers out there and the Lyme sufferers themselves to have the proper resources to be diagnosed and treated and go on with their lives and have the options necessary and available at their fingertips so I believe what we'll be sharing here today, and certainly with Dr. Horowitz's work, um, I really believe that we can make a difference. And so this is not only education, but this is about empowering all of us. Because change comes from each of us. We can't be the victims. We have to be active in our engagement. And so do not accept when you're not heard or you're not seen. So first off, my name is Ron Stram. I guess some of you may know that. Um, so I'm a conventionally trained doc. I went to medical school in New York City. And pretty interesting because I actually went to medical school during the HIV epidemic. And there are really similar parallels 
about the misinformation and the misunderstanding of HIV. If you remember back in the 80s, HIV was called the gay plague. What a horrible way to alienate and marginalize a group of people. And only when the inclusion of more symptoms and more diagnostic testing came into play did the death rate actually change. And you'll see that. That has not happened with Lyme. In fact, it's even more marginalized. Because many of you know this. You don't have a diagnosis. You've got another diagnosis. You've got rheumatoid arthritis, chronic fatigue syndrome, multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's. Really, at 40 years old? That's a little unusual. So, in order to get a clearer picture about Lyme disease, we first have to talk about the presentation of the disease. One size does not fit all. And in fact, the presentation is so wide and varied that unless you have an accurate test, it's really difficult to know who's acutely presenting with Lyme disease. And like other conditions in medicine, early intervention is how you reduce the chronicity. Who ever heard of a test that isn't valid for three to four weeks later? And that's not even that it's valid. It's only 50% sensitive. Who would ever do that? There is no scientist in the room that would ever allow a test that only gives you 50%. Never. How can we allow that for such a severe disease? It would be like you coming into an emergency room and saying, look, doc, I got chest pain. Okay, well, let me get an EKG. Oh, your EKG is fine. You can go home. That's it. We're done. Because that's about right. Unless you have an acute positive EKG, 50% of them actually don't give you a diagnosis. You need to keep working it up. So that's where we are with Lyme disease. We're at the 50%. Because under the CDC's criteria for Lyme disease presentation, they include fever, chills. Well, that's pretty unusual. Headache, fatigue muscle ache, joint aches, swollen lymph nodes. How many of those symptoms have you had whenever you get sick? <laughs> wow. So wait, we got a 50% chance of having a test that will tell you if you have Lyme disease. So how is that acceptable? It is not acceptable. And nor should anyone in this room accept it. Because... If you look on the other side of the screen, that's actually all the presenting symptoms you can have with Lyme disease. Headache, confusion, drenching night sweats, migrating joint pain, extreme fatigue. We need a test that we can give to anyone just like you go to your doc's office and say, well, let me get us a blood count and basic metabolic profile. That's the test we need. You're sick, let's get that test, just like any other test. Not a special test, it's like any other test. So you've heard about the two-tier testing. I won't go into that that much except to say that it really should be thrown out. <laughs> and yes, we utilize the test from a Lyme literate, and some people find offense with that. I believe that we're just Lyme actively seeking physicians or practitioners information. So we try to utilize whatever is out there, and it's still not good. So instead of using 5 out of 10 bands, we'll use 2 out of 10 bands that are specific and sensitive. We may use only one 
out of the three bands, and we could say, you know, that's pretty sensitive for Lyme. But even then, as you heard from Dr. Horowitz, if you have Borrelia mimoti, none of those bands would be positive. Well, that's good. So 40% of Lyme patients end up with long-term health problems, and that's because we are not getting them early. If we get them early, we get them in the ER, at the urgent care, when you present to your physician's office. We believe the chronicity will go down way, way down. Because, yes, I can tell you about all the treatments that we have, but let's face it, this is a shitty disease. I mean, a year of treatment, two years, five years, when's it going to end? And this isn't a trajectory that goes this way. Oh, yeah, you take this and you just get better. No, it goes this way, this way. And it can make you feel hopeless. And that's when you have your parents and your mother and your father and your brother and your significant other saying, come on, you could do this. You can take that pill. We need more. We deserve more. As a community, we deserve more. So, <laughs> let's talk about what we can do. So we love the gut. The gut's great. The gut's where we start. So we really think that a lot of benefit of treatment, it starts out in the gut. One, because 70% of all your immune function actually works from your gut upwards. In fact, your neurotransmitters are produced, 70% of them, in your gut. So you ever get sick and you feel really depressed or anxious? That's because it's like going into a different mode. It's saying, look, I can't make all those neurotransmitters. Let's just wait. We've got to like, get you better. But wait, I feel really miserable. Yeah, but we've got to get you better first. So we really look at the gut as a very important aspect of treatment. And probiotics are the key. Because right now, that's what we have. And probiotics, we both use them orally and... I won't ask how many in this audience I've asked to use it the other way, but there is another way. <laughs> and I hate to tell you, but that has been a very, very successful treatment option. So we use uh, probiotics both orally, but it takes, you know, 36 feet to get there. It only takes about a foot and a half or two feet to get the other way. And I will tell you that typically, if people can tolerate it, almost everyone's symptoms, no matter what they are, will get improved. Uh, Dr. Horowitz mentioned artemisia. Artemisia is now kind of one of our more favorite herbs. It is a uh, really kind of interesting, interesting herb. So... Dr. Yu Yu Tu, who if she got married to Yo-Yo Ma, I don't know what that would make. But, but anyway, um, so she actually won the Nobel Prize, Nobel Prize for Medicine um, because of her work with Artemisia. And she's been working with it for 50 years. And the reason why is it's, it's so readily available and it's pretty easy to use because it's... So it's heat labile, meaning you can't boil it, but you can steep it and get the artemisian, which can be used as an anti-malarial agent. And it has a really high effectivity rate by using that. And her work has shown that. So that people that live in areas that they have no access to real medical care can actually grow artemisia and treat themselves. And so it's pretty remarkable, and a company that we're using, which please visit, um, has developed an intravenous form of artemisia, which is called artesanate, 
which we have used now in our practice for the past couple of months and have had some significant success with Babesia-like symptoms. And the dosing is actually about one-fifth of the normal dosing that is used for artemisia. And the side effects are relatively rare, and when it comes to sort of symptom improvement, we found that night sweats, headaches, and air hunger improves, and that the treatment course is relatively short. We typically use the same type of model that they use for malaria, and the treatment course is typically about seven treatments. Um, so it's a very interesting and kind of new idea. And as you know, we're an integrative practice, and Dr. Horowitz does this too. We look to get you off of the bad antibiotics. We look to convert you to herbal alternatives that may be less harmful. So in clinical trials with malaria, IV artesanate has been shown to have a low toxicity profile. Its therapies are contraindicated in pregnancy, especially in the first trimester, and is not recommended in lactation. So my next favorite amino acid is N-acetylcysteine. And N-acetylcysteine is the rate-limiting step for glutathione production. And as was spoken about briefly by Dr. Horowitz, glutathione is a tripeptide. It includes glutamate, and, you know, cysteine, and glycine. But interesting, if you give glutamate or glycine, it does not promote glutathione synthesis. Only if you give N-acetylcysteine. And how did I get to, you know, like the use of N-acetylcysteine? Well, it's actually the antidote for the number one cause of liver failure in the U.S. Tylenol overdose. So, pretty interesting. It, it, if you get someone that has an acute Tylenol overdose, and Tylenol is a very dangerous drug. Someone takes a bottle of Tylenol, no treatment, a week later, they'll die of liver failure, or they'll die within that few time. So it is involved in DNA synthesis and repair, metabolism of toxins, and immune function. It increases that of glutathione synthesis by fourfold, and because of its structural size, it gets into the cell. And it is responsible then for removing toxins and immune system function. So in practice, we use intravenous vitamin C, intravenous N-acetylcysteine, glutathione, novel uses of curcumin or turmeric intravenously, resveratrol, acetylcarnitine, and intramuscular CoQ10, which we've seen remarkable effects with Parkinson's-like tremors. Guidelines are continually changing. And as you see, just like with other guidelines, emergency medicine guidelines, HIV, we are in 1993. What was good in 1993? I don't, I don't remember. But anyway, 1993 is when we expanded the definition of HIV disease. And until we expand the definition of Lyme disease, we will keep missing patients. As you see, when those were changed, the death rate for HIV went down. The incident rate for Lyme disease had gone up, and the only reason why there is a drop in 2010 is because mandatory reporting is not needed, right? No, because it's so much they got overwhelmed. So there's actually less only because it's not reported. So the best practice of medicine involves a continuous feedback from patients, research labs, and analysis resulting in appropriate action. So please, take action. Thank you so much.